sixth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, if you want to go ahead and open that up and, and, and hold that in readiness. And in this chapter, Jesus is going to show us that it is not the duration of a life, how many years that we live, but the donation in life, what we do with those years that really counts for something. Let me ask you a question. If you died right now, don't look so serious. I think you're okay. But if you died right now, what, what donation would you have made to life itself? Would you die basically saying, you know, I don't, I don't think I have really contributed to my fellow man? Have you been more of a consumer or a contributor? There are a lot of people who have lived many long years, and when they died, basically all you could say is that they, they consumed through their entire life. They lived 365 days a year, but they never became a giver in life. I've known people who died very young, in their 20s, and you could look at them and you could say, you know what, they were a giver. They donated, they, they gave, they, they helped their fellow man. In Luke 6, as we begin to unfold this passage, it is obvious to me that when Jesus taught us about giving, he was not thinking about our bank accounts or how many homes we have or whether or not we own our home or rent our home or whether our cars are used or, or new. He teaches us that some of the biggest givers in life have very few assets in the world's eyes. And some of the biggest consumers have everything to give. So Luke 6, beginning in verse 20, we read these words. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day. Leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their fathers treated the prophets. Now, notice in verse 20 that the people that are blessed or, or happy... Jesus says they have no finances. They have little finances. Verse 21, they have little food. In verse 22, they have very few friends. Now the world would never think of that kind of a person as blessed, but Jesus sees it differently. He continues, verse 24, But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. And here Jesus goes from happy and blessed to woe and wretched. Now it's interesting in verse 24, that he speaks of people who do have money. In verse 25, he's speaking about people who do have food. Verse 26, he's speaking about those who have a lot of friends. And what Jesus is doing as he finishes the Sermon on the Mount is literally dropping a series of bombshells on people. And this is grabbing them. It kind of grabs us when we think about it. He's entering... A whole passage of about 13 verses of, on giving. And he starts off by saying, you are blessed and you are happy when you have very little finances, very little food, and very few friends. And you are wretched when you have a lot of finances, a lot of food, and a lot of friends. Is Jesus anti-rich and pro-poor? No, no. That really doesn't have anything to do with this passage. Here's what he is saying. If you are a contributor, if you have been giving in this life, then you will be blessed in the future. If you live as a consumer, then your comfort will only last while you're here. 
I remember seeing a plaque when I was growing up. I read it many times. I remembered the, the words, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for God will last. We have a choice to be a consumer or a giver. And Jesus is wanting us to understand that being a giver has nothing to do with assets. Some people think that they don't have anything to give. That is an excuse. That is a lie. God has given you talents. God has blessed you. He has made you unique and you do have gifts. The issue is not, do you have anything to give? The real issue is whether you choose to be a giver or a taker. Verse 27, Jesus says, but I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. How many assets or possessions do you have to have to love your enemies? What size checking account do you have to have to do good to people who hate you? What kind of car do you need to drive to bless those who curse you? It has nothing to do with your stuff, but it does have everything to do with your attitude. 1985. Anchorage, Alaska, there was a very bad earthquake. It caused a lot of ruin and damage. And the governor had a lot of people writing him and calling him for assistance, for repairs. Those in government were very concerned for the people. So the governor went on television to let the people know what it was that was going to happen. Federal and state aid was going to be offered. He said, I've been receiving thousands of demands in the last few days. As your governor, I have felt the pressure of the people. As your leader, I want to close out this telecast by reading something that I received from a 10-year-old boy that has kind of lifted the load off of my shoulders. It was on a 3 by 5 card. It had two nickels with scotch tape attached to the card. The little boy had written this down. Use this whenever it is needed. If you need more, let me know. Two nickels, millions of dollars. It is all an attitude. It has nothing to do with your finances. I want to give you three truths about givers this morning. Number one, write this down in your sermon sheet. Givers live on a higher level than most people. In other words, Jesus is teaching us that you can take the low road or you can take the high road. The high road is traveled by people who give in life. Look what he says. Verse 27 continues. But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak, don't stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, don't demand it back. Socrates said, know thyself. Cicero said, control thyself. Jesus said, give thyself. Givers are always giving. Christianity puts an emphasis on what you do. Jesus describes the giver. A giver loves his enemies. He, he prays for those who, who hurt him. The giver walks the extra mile. He turns the other cheek. In other words, Christianity is not this big list of don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. Christianity is not legalism. Secondly, and write this down, givers do more than is expected. They do not settle for what is the easiest thing, the path of least resistance. Look how it continues in chapter 6 of Luke. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. What Jesus is talking about is not natural. He's talking about us living in a place where we do more than what is expected. The world doesn't understand this kind of thinking. 
But this kind of thinking can absolutely change our world. It will change your family. It will change your life. You start to live this way where you do more than what is expected of you and your life will take a dramatic turn for the better. That is a guarantee. Third, write this down. Givers do good asking nothing in return. Look at verse 35 in the text. But love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back then reward, your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. He did not say that if you become this kind of giver that you would have nothing in return. What he said was to expect nothing in return. In fact, isn't it interesting that he tells us as, as we expect nothing in return, the very next phrase is, then your reward will be great. Almost sounds like a paradox. Give expecting nothing and your reward will be great. This is the difference between a giver and a consumer. The consumer will give every once in a while, but he expects something in return. And that really is not giving at all. That is called trading. Do you know people who keep score? They walk around with a, with a pad in their hand and, and they keep score. If you, if you do something nice for them, they take note. They'll return the favor. Those kind of people can, can make you miserable because it's so easy to forget who owes who. There are three levels of giving. Write these down. First, there is the grace level. This is where you say, what do I want God to do through me? This is the highest level that you can live at. This is the level where you decide to be a, a channel, a, a river of resources that flow right through you to somebody else around you. Then there is the grit level. This is where you just kind of suck it in and you, you grit your teeth and you say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? Well, God won't be working through us, but we will do our best to try to do what God wants by working it out in our own flesh. And this is where you, you try to do your best to carry the cross of Jesus all by yourself. You, you don't ask for help, but you're just trying, trying really hard. And then finally, there is the, the third level, the get even level. This is where you say, what do I want to do? And if this is where you live, then you're the type of person who always wants to do unto others as you have just been done. You are always going to be trading, and you will be quite miserable. These are the three options. You can be the kind of person who is always looking out for number one. And these kind of people, we don't like to be around very much. You can be like the person that keeps score. They give, but they do expect something in return. Or you can be like the person who says, you know, I'm going to give. And that person knows that God is the source of everything that they have. See, the fourth thing that you need to understand is this. Givers understand the principle of, of sowing and reaping. In the text, verses 36 through 38, Jesus says, Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. The principle of sowing and reaping is not, I give you something now and you give me something back later. That is trading. The principle of sowing and reaping is understanding that God is the source. And doing good without seeking a reward is just doing good. Here's the deal. You, you have to ask yourself the question, who is the source? If you don't share 
or give, then you think that you are the source. If you give expecting a return, then you think that other people are the source. But if you give expecting no return, then God is your source. John D. Rockefeller, at the age of 23, was a millionaire. By the age of 50, he was a billionaire and the richest man in the world during his time. But he was a miserable, miserable rich man. At the age of 53, he was so eaten up with physical diseases and ulcers. He was, he was a grabber. He wasn't a giver. So he's 53 and doctors tell him, you have about one year to live, John. That's it. His greed had so consumed him, he was riddled with all kinds of physical maladies. And now the richest man in the world was faced with one year left of life. And all he could eat that year, all his stomach could handle, was milk and crackers. Now, for a person who loves to eat, that is a terrible thing to happen to anyone. This man could go and buy any restaurant he wanted in the entire world. He could have any food put before him. But during this year, as he began to make an assessment of his life's gains, he realized that he was actually a very poor, poor man. And John D. Rockefeller began to turn his life around and he became a giver. In fact, he gave to everybody. He gave to churches, he gave to hospitals, he gave so much to medicine. Many of the wonderful discoveries that we have had in the past 50 years have been because of monies that were donated by the John D. Rockefeller Foundation. That greedy old man that had one year left to live, when he started giving, he started releasing all of that stress that was in his body and he got rid of those ulcers. And you know what? when he was given one year to live at the age of 53, he ended up living to be 90 years old. Some of you are killing yourselves with stress because you're just grabbing all the time. You're a consumer. You want to get even. You want to stay ahead. And the more that you grab, the more resentment and bitterness builds up in your life, in your body. So here's, here's where we're going with this message this morning. In the third chapter of Malachi, the Lord tells us to, to turn to him, to trust him, and even to test him. When you give a tithe, a tenth of your income, you are, you are turning your heart to God and trusting him with your finances and you are testing him to see if he will fulfill his promise in your life. I have been asked many times over the years about tithing. What should I tithe? Where should I tithe? Should I tithe at a church? Should I tithe to some ministry I see on TV? Where is it that I should tithe? I believe that you need to tithe where you are fed. Where do you go for spiritual food? If you come back here every week and you eat a meal, but you never tithe, Scripture would say that you are robbing. I want you to begin to understand how different grace and the law really are. The law said one mile is all you need to do. Grace says go two miles. The law says an eye for an eye. Grace says, you know what, turn the other cheek. The law said, you know, a tithe is, is all you need. Grace says, become a very generous giver. Today is the day that some of you need to commit to tithe for the very first time. If you have never done this, if you've never actually tithed, taken 10% of your income and, and made sure you commit that to the Lord, then I'm going to ask you just to do it for 90 days. Test the Lord in this. See if he will not fulfill his promises in your life. If you have stopped tithing, you need to start tithing again. You are robbing the Lord. It's that simple. You say, well, I can't afford to do it right now. I would say, you can't afford not to do it right now. And finally, some of you, if, if you have never not tithed, 
I mean, that's all you've ever done. You've, you've never given more than 10%. I believe that you will not grow in your walk with the Lord until you become a very generous giver. One mile is not enough, so says grace. Give more than the tithe. See how God blesses your life. I don't say these things because I want your money. I don't need your money. The Lord doesn't need your money. I say this because our church can never truly grow in its membership until our membership have grown in their spirituality. And you will not grow spiritually unless you are a generous giver.